Well, according to Catholic doctrine, the place of purgatory is given to a person who has the grace of Christ, but at the point of their death here on earth, they haven't received uh, enough if you will, grace for the sins that they've committed. So they go to a place where they are purged of this remaining sinfulness so they can enter into the joy of heaven. This place is called purgatory. And why am I bringing that up? Because in this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3 that we're going to look at today, it seems a little bit like Peter might be talking about purgatory. Is he? Well, we're going to talk about that as we dive into our study. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeremy Bannister of Heights Christian Church, and we're going through the Bible in five years' period of time. If it's always been a goal of yours to go through the Word of God, we invite you to do that with us by subscribing to our channel, clicking the bell for notification, and you'll receive a devotional much like this one. We'll read just a little bit of the Scripture together and pull one thing from it to be more like Jesus. Well, if you're as curious as I am concerning what I could mean about purgatory, let's jump into the scripture and see where this confusion can come in and see if we can bring some clarity to it. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Wow, so we read the last section of of this scripture Because we have this theme that keeps uh, showing itself up, that we need to live a holy life even though the world around us slanders us. That's what we've been seeing over and over again. But here at the very end, it talks about Jesus suffering once and for all for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And then he talks about these spirits in prison. Boy, that sounds a whole lot like purgatory, but is it? So let's look at the context of this again. Let's break it down just a little bit. And what we'll see is we don't have a doctrine of purgatory, but rather we have a looking back at what had happened during the days of Noah. So let's take a look at that real quick. For Christ also suffered, verse 18, once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which... He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. All right, so what are we talking about in this passage? What we're seeing here is that God, Peter is referring back to Noah, that in the days of Noah, the Spirit of Christ was preaching through Noah to the people who disobeyed long ago, who are now 
spirits in prison awaiting judgment. There, there's not salvation for these spirits who are in prison. Christ didn't go down to preach to the spirits in prison so that they could be freed after death. Not at all. As a matter of fact, the rest of that, the rest of that passage says that the only ones that were saved were those eight people that were in the ark. In other words, Christ was speaking through Noah in the days of Noah with the Spirit of God speaking through Noah to try and save people, but only eight people in all were saved. Only eight people listened to Noah as these floodwaters were coming over all the earth. And this, this same proclamation of trusting in God is revealed also in baptism. And this idea of baptism saving us, not through just going under the water, but rather a confession of faith that Jesus Christ is Lord, for which baptism is a, a word picture of, of Jesus going into the grave and coming out, and we doing the same thing, going into the grave and coming out a new man in Jesus Christ. That's what saves us, is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so what we're looking at here is this, if it's Jesus's work that saves us, then there's not an amount of quote-unquote sins that have to be taken care of upon death. All has been paid through Christ. As a matter of fact, this passage begins and ends with the idea that Christ suffered once for sins, and we don't have to suffer for them. It's Jesus who suffers for them. Ours is the acceptance of his sacrifice on our behalf that moves us from this place of death to life. And that proclamation is heard also in the waters of baptism as we give that confession to other people, as we proclaim, guess what? I no longer am living for myself. I'm living for Jesus. That old person, that old person who was me died. And now I'm being raised to walk in a newness of life that I'm proclaiming Christ. My sins have been forever paid for by Jesus. And upon death, I'm not going to have to wait to be in the presence of my Lord and Savior. So no, this passage in Peter isn't talking about purgatory. Rather, it's talking about those who are in prison and ju waiting judgment, that you and I are either going to be in waiting and judgment after this life is over, or we're going to be ushered into glory to be with Jesus and there be with the Lord forever. And so my prayer for you and myself is, guess what? I want to make sure that me and the decisions I make reflect the one whom I say I serve. God bless you. I hope that helps you out this day, and we'll talk with you again tomorrow.